Okay, hello and welcome to lesson four on our World War II unit. And today we're looking at the home front. Okay, so in the last lesson, we looked at Winston Churchill's speech of the we will fight them on the beaches. Uh, we started looking at the Battle of Britain and we looked at the German Luftwaffe and how they had four times as many planes as the RAF. We looked at the RAF secret weapons, radar and Spitfire. And we looked at the amazing story of Ray Holmes and how he saved Buckingham Palace from German bombers. Now, before moving on, we're just going to finish off a little bit of the Battle of Britain. So, July to October 1940 was the Battle of Britain. For three and a half months, the Luftwaffe sent wave after wave of bombers over the English Channel in an attempt to destroy the RAF and crush the people of Britain's morale. But with each new deadly wave of bombers that flew over, the pilots of the RAF fought them back. Now, we've also got to remember that it wasn't just British pilots in the RAF at this point. There were Polish pilots, there were French pilots, there were Belgian pilots. Essentially, every country that had been invaded by the Nazis, many of the pilots had escaped and come to Britain to carry on the fight. Finally, after three and a half months, the Nazis admitted defeat and withdrew their attack on the RAF and cancelled their invasion of Great Britain. The RAF had defeated the Nazi onslaught and stopped the unstoppable German conquest of Europe. For the first time in the war, the Nazis had lost. During the Battle of Britain, Winston Churchill said this, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. All hearts go out to the fighter pilots whose brilliant actions we see with our own eyes day after day. The RAF had won the Battle of Britain. However, the Germans did not stop their attack. Although they stopped attacking in the daytime, they moved to attacking at night. This was the beginning of the Blitz. As you can see, this is some of your artwork I've put up there. It looks quite nice, actually. Okay, the Blitz. Following the end of the Battle of Britain, the German Luftwaffe continued bombing British cities, but only at night. This was called the Blitz, or lightning in German. It comes from Blitzkrieg, which was the tactic they used when they invaded many countries in Europe. Although they couldn't hit smaller targets precisely, flying at night allowed the bombers to hide in the darkness from attacking Spitfires. To defend the cities, the army would use spotlights, barrage balloons and anti-aircraft guns to spot the bombers, cause them to crash and shoot them down. Now you can see at the bottom here there's three pictures. The one on the left is the spotlights and they'd use those to scan the sky and if they saw a bomber they'd just follow it because the spotlight would firstly blind the pilots inside but also allow the aircraft guns to actually see where the bombers were. Second you can see the barrage balloons. Now they're not just like a balloon that's escaped from a fair. The barrage balloon's job was essentially to cause the bombers to crash. They'd either have to avoid them or they'd hit them. And finally, the picture on the far right is an anti-aircraft gun. Now, the heaviest nighttime bombing of British cities lasted between 1940 to 1941. During that time, the Germans dropped thousands of heavy bombs and incendiary devices, or fire bombs, on the cities. As the siren went off, people would have to take shelter in bomb shelters and wait until they heard the all-clear whistle. At one point, the Germans bombed London for 50 57 days in a row. Now the Blitz didn't just hit London, they hit Liverpool, Glasgow, Portsmouth, Coventry, in fact any major hub or factory area the Germans did try and bomb. Now the British did use some tactics to try and divert the bombers away from the cities such as they turned off all the lights in the cities or they made people pull up blinds to cover the windows or they in fact they even created fake cities in the countryside so the Germans who were looking for the lights of the city, would end up bombing fields. However, the bombing of London didn't end until 1945, the end of the war, with the Germans even building new terrifying flying bombs called V1 rockets, or doodlebugs, and massive V2 rockets. These were called terror weapons. Now, the terror weapons were terrifying. You wouldn't know where they were coming from. There was no plane. All of a sudden, there would just be a a screech in the air and a massive explosion. The V1 doodlebugs, which were kind of like rocket-powered planes, Spitfires could actually attack and tip over their wings. But the V2 rockets, there was no stopping them. However, it wasn't just the Germans that were bombing cities. From 1940 onwards, the British RAF began bombing German cities in revenge for the attacks on London. Using the same tactics as the Germans, 
the British bombed German cities at night, dropping heavy bombs and firebombs, causing the same level of terror in Germany. The bombing of civilian targets, that means non-military targets, is called total war. In total war, every part of society is at war. Now this does bring up a moral question. Do you think it was right for both sides to bomb civilians during the war? So in total war, every part of society is involved in the war. From the planes fighting in the air, to the farmers planting potatoes in the fields, everyone is involved in the war effort. To inspire people to keep working throughout the war, the government created propaganda posters to help inspire and motivate the people. Now we've actually got three propaganda posters here. We've got one that says, leave this to us, Sonny. We've got one that says, dig for victory, grow your own vegetables. And we've got a third one, which is just a spade, and it says, dig for victory. Now, what do you think is interesting about the colours they've used? Any interesting language? Who's the audience? What's their message? What's their purpose? What we're going to do is we're just going to look very briefly at, let's say, dig for victory. So, when we look at the colours they've used there, we can see it's bold and red. This is obviously to catch people's eyes and the font they use the writing is very very clear it's dig for victory it's a command and you see they've even used capital letters to make it stand out they've then also used a actual picture not a cartoon to show that you can do this it's a very simple message there's no debate about it there's no level of knowledge that you'd need to understand what this means it just means dig as in dig the fields for vegetables the audience is probably everyone that can pick up a spade What's the message? It means grow your own food. Okay, we're going to do a short activity now where you're going to analyse two propaganda posters. You're going to analyse the Leave This To Us, Sonny, you ought to be out of London. And you're also going to analyse the Dig For Victory, Grow Your Own Vegetables poster. Both of these are very different, but I want you to analyse using the same set of questions. Firstly, who's this poster directed at? What's the message it's trying to give? Is there anything interesting about the colours used? What do you notice about the picture? What details have been included? What type of language has the poster used? Is it formal or informal? Now you can use these sheets if you'd like, if you can print them off, that's fine. Or you can get a picture of those and put it on your computer and add bubbles around it and answer all the questions and do a bit of research using the internet. Whatever you find most suitable. Now I want you to spend about five minutes on this task just to get the idea of just breaking them down and looking at how they're made. After that, we're gonna move on to the next task. Pause the video now until you've finished analyzing those propaganda posters. Okay, so you've either left the video going or you've finished the task and you're moving on. I hope you finished the task. Okay, right, now we're gonna go on to another propaganda poster activity. Using the same techniques you've just looked at, you're now gonna create a World War II propaganda poster aimed at a part of British society. In the poster, try and include an easy to remember slogan, remember, dig for victory. Vivid colours, remember how they use the reds and the yellows. Simple and clear headings. Make sure it's aimed at a specific audience. For example, children, farmers, milkmen, factory workers. You can even have it aimed at photographers or cyclists or anybody that you feel like, yes, they are gonna need motivating during the war. Now, how you make the propaganda poster is completely up to you. You could draw it, you could use some kind of digital drawing program, you could create one on Word, you could create one on Publisher, you could create one on Photoshop or InDesign if you have those programs. You could even create one using a combination of different propaganda posters. I'm gonna let you be as creative and wonderful as you can. Once you finish them, send them to me and we'll add them to our Padlet page. Okay, that's it for part one of the home front. I'll see you in the next lesson.